All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, welcome to the Africa Regional Training 2021. This year's training will focus on charging infrastructure for e-mobility. It will be split into two sections. We have the first one starting this week and the second one at the end of October. And the first training will be an overview of e-mobility specifically in East Africa. But of course, we know that we are having participation from all over Africa and possibly other parts of the world. As we start, feel free to let us know in the chat function where you're joining us from. We'd love to see how widespread we are in today's participation. We do hope for a very interactive session and we have a long lineup of distinguished um, experts in the field of immobility. I will very quickly hand over to Oliver who will introduce the Solutions Plus project and also welcome you to the regional training. Over to you, Oliver. Thank you very much, Judith, and uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. My name is Oliver La. I'm based at the Wuppertal Institute in the Technical University Berlin, and I coordinate the Urban Electric Mobility Initiative for UN Habitat. And uh, we run this project, Solutions Plus, with a big family of uh, 48 partners uh, from around the world, bringing together cities, industry, uh, academia, universities, international organizations, working on 10 living labs and then replicating them across the region. This is a project supported by the European Union and uh, it's a four-year project ending in 2023. We focus on vehicles operation and integration with regard to electric mobility. So uh, there is a distinct focus on the development of different types of vehicles, two and three wheelers, minibuses, e-taxis, shared fleet, bus conversions, and then focusing on innovative charging solutions, mobility as a service applications, and the integration of all of those solutions into public and private sector business models and planning documents. This goes along a, a five pillar approach uh, where we co-develop innovative solutions together. We start with informing uh, our partners, cities, industries, uh, startups on uh, innovative e-mobility solutions that are out there, inspire to through peer-to-peer -peer exchange and initiate partnerships on the public and private sector side, and then implement demonstrations that can be replicated and transferred. Um, and of course, all of that is meant to uh, generate impact with regard to climate change mitigation, sustainable development, but also economic and social development across the regions. This all feeds into a toolbox that we will be sharing uh, on the website. There was an initial one that we're currently developing um, and more will be feeding into this toolbox as we go through the project. This will also be the basis for all our capacity building and peer-to-peer -peer exchange, one of which we're currently sitting in. And uh, a, a core component of the whole project is the innovation and startup support, which is part of the startup incubator that we're having in this project where we are supporting an initial group of startups across the region on innovative e-mobility solutions and developing them further. A key bit here, of course, is uh, the group of 10 initial living labs, Montevideo, Quito, Madrid, Hamburg, Kigali, Dar es Salaam, Kathmandu, Nanjing, Hanoi, Pasig. And uh, uh, this is a joint um, activity together with our colleagues from UN Environment and the International Energy Agency with a sister project funded by the Global Environment Facility. And this project will end with replicable, transferable business models for public and private sector actors on different types of e-mobility solutions for public um, and shared fleet for passenger and freight transportation. Sorry, my uh, presentation keeps moving. Um, as well as uh, for different types of operations and integration. I'm very much looking forward to a very interactive discussion in this regional training. Um, and we'll hand it over to Judith again. Welcome to the regional training for Africa. 
Thank you, Oliver. And yes, indeed, welcome everyone to the regional training. I can see a lot of activity in the chat. Uh, you're all letting us know where you're joining us from. This is really good. So I think I should also say um, good afternoon to some. I should also say good evening to some because I can see we're having quite a wide um, spread participation. Um, so I will simply run us through the program for today. Um, as Oliver has already mentioned, the regional training is part of the capacity building and peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And the Africa regional training will focus on five units. The first unit will be on the why and how of electric mobility in East Africa within the wider context of sustainable mobility. And then we will go into EV charging infrastructure where we will talk about solutions and standards focusing on two and three wheelers and shared light duty vehicles. Um, on the third day, we will talk about financing, public procurement and business models, again, focusing on two, on two and three wheelers as well as shared light duty vehicles. We have a very interesting session on Thursday that is on EV charging points where we talk about characteristics and localization, basically how to locate charging points when you're rolling out um, electric mobility charging infrastructure. And here we will have um, our colleagues from FIA, UNEP, of course, um, contributing very interesting points on that. And lastly, on Friday, we will talk about a case for electrified public transport. We will talk about the feasibility of e-buses in the African context, and also get to have some experiential um, examples from around the globe and also um, some parts of Africa. So very quickly, um, I will hand over to UN Environment, who will talk about the current status of e-mobility in Africa and give us an overview of what is happening on the continent. Where have we come from? Where are we now? And where are we going? Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now, yes? Yes, I do. Okay, so very good. Then I'm uh, uh, running now through this presentation, the current state of electric mobility in Africa. Um, <clears throat> so, Let's start with some background. Um, ICCT, the um, International Council, Council for Clean Transportation, they recently did a nice analysis. Um, and uh, what they did is they looked at what are the baseline uh, uh, emissions in 2020 from the transport sector in, uh, on the African continent. What will be um, emissions from the transport sector in 2050, in case we are not doing anything that is uh, 2050 baseline. And then uh, what we could do, or what we could achieve in terms of uh, CO2 emissions from the uh, transport sector, if we go for ambitious uh, scaling up of zero emission vehicles. Huh? Um, so basically what it shows is that uh, between, uh, between now and 2050, there's a good chance that emissions from the transport sector quadruple if we are not um, doing anything about technology, about um, the way we're using mobility, about um, uh, active mobility, these sort of things. Um, while on the other side, if we would just introduce the technology option, basically going to zero, electric, uh, zero, zero emission vehicles, meaning a big share of electric vehicles, then we could actually go below the uh, CO2 emissions uh, which we see today. Now in this slide, um, unfortunately, they, they use the ISO codes for the countries. So of course, big countries have a big share. So we, know, we see Nigeria, we see um, South Africa, we see um, Algeria. This is what is uh, hidden behind DZA in this slide. Um, <clears throat> now, which vehicle modes to start with? Um, if you want to go for electrification in Africa. Um, so for sure, we need to focus at fleet vehicles and for sure there are modes which are easier to um, electrify than others. So what this slide is, is, is showing is basically a summary of the vehicle modes we are currently focusing at when we're talking about electric mobility in, uh, on the African continent. That is uh, first and foremost, electric two and three wheelers. Um, reason for that is that essentially the technology is economically viable. It's also technically mature, even though maybe there's not always the right product on the, uh, on the market, but uh, this is not a question of 
technology being available, available but a question of have the players really uh, uh, understood uh, the market and the potential of the market and uh, can they have they really understood to to sort of um, package the right vehicle um, then uh, for two and three wheelers and um, charging at home outlets is feasible so that is of course a big advantage because you don't need a, a vast uh, charging infrastructure um, battery swapping is very feasible so that is actually a second option of uh, charging which is uh, uh, very much uh, sort of investigated by a couple of market actors. Um, basically, whenever the electric uh, battery is depleted, you swap the battery and you get a new battery, which is fully charged up. Um, while under that sort of scheme, ownership of the battery is not with the owner of the motorcycle, but with the battery swapping uh, company. So that means that actually, uh, the electric motorcycle is relatively cheap because you don't have this um, huge chunk of investment, which is the battery itself, but you sort of pay for a filled up battery, maybe a $1.50, maybe $2, maybe $2.50, depending on the business model. Um, and you basically use your electric motorcycle as if you would use a, a conventional one and, and, and fill up the tank. Uh, and what we see is already right now, pretty high growth rates of uh, electric uh, two and three wheelers. And of course, this is linked uh, to the generally very high growth rates of two and three wheelers in Africa. Um, now I directly go to the right and I'm looking at the electric buses. Again, um, electric buses are economically viable on high capacity lines. Um, E-buses really have a very high potential to improve local, local air quality. I mean, for example, I'm living in Nairobi. I see it here in Nairobi, how much air quality is deteriorated by um, the buses and by uh, and by the uh, mini taxis they are called matatus here. Um, and really, uh, buses do have a very big um, uh, potential to improve that. And then again, uh, since it's fleet operations, there's a manageable charging infrastructure because you basically need charging infrastructure at the depots, and you don't need to have a public charging infrastructure. Now, if you look at the, uh, in, in the middle of that slide, we have uh, electric light duty vehicles, cars, basically. But again, uh, in, in the context of our uh, ambitions of what we're doing on the African continent, um, it's focusing on uh, fleet vehicles. Yeah? Again, they are close to break, to break even with conventional cars. They are technically mature. And of course, uh, in terms of mitigation potential, total mitigation potential for fuel use, for air pollutants, for greenhouse gas emissions, then of course cars have the biggest mitigation potential. But um, let's say uh, uh, until we are at the point that uh, we are talking a lot about individual ownership of electric cars, that's maybe a longer way to go in, uh, in the African context. Again, we are focusing on, on, on fleet vehicles. Um, just to recap, of course, there's a uh, big amount of opportunities. We have economic benefits at micro and, and, and at macro level, basically reduced energy use, maintenance costs, which is resulting in lower operational costs and also total cost of ownership for EV users at the actual um, driver level, user level, the ones who are operating an electric uh, vehicle. And therefore, um, it can lead to increased, uh, to increased personal income. Now, on the macro side, um, the use of uh, sort of uh, locally produced energy, locally generated power, instead of imported petroleum uh, products, of course, reduce government's energy bills and make them less vulnerable to uh, the volatile oil market. So there's a lot of benefit in that. Um, <clears throat> what we already see is that many startups now manufacturing, assembling electric motorcycles and tuk-tuks in uh, on the African uh, continent, in East Africa, but also in West Africa. And of course, um, this is uh, creating a local value chain and uh, creating green jobs. So there's, there's much more to it than just using the vehicle. Um, <clears throat> and then there are, there are other side effects, for example, that uh, electric two and three wheelers could actually uh, be, a, uh, be a key enabler in rural electrification. Yeah? So if you're looking at, uh, let's say, least developed countries with relatively low access rate to grid electricity, um, then in many cases, uh, starting off grid operations uh, uh, struggle with low power demand. Now, if you would add a locally used fleet of electric 
motorcycles or electric three wheelers, maybe a fleet of 50, maybe a fleet of 100, maybe more, then this immediately sort of uh, brings power demand, which might actually justify then the installation of a, uh, of a mini grid application. Eh? Because now you have demand and now you have basically people paying for electricity and now there might be a business to make with um, uh, off grid applications. Um, of course, we have the environmental benefits, um, reduced use of petroleum fuel, substitution with clean power. And by the way, uh, in many African countries, especially in East Africa, uh, power grids are already very clean. Uh, I mean, Kenya, for example, has, 80, has 85% uh, renewable power generation in uh, the grid. Um, so now, of course, this leads to significant re reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. That, uh, that means uh, to significantly improve air quality because we reduce um, NOx emissions, we reduce uh, particular matter emissions, we reduce uh, the emissions of hydrocarbons and uh, carbon monoxide. And this is uh, in particular, this is very true for, for urban area, areas. Yeah? Now also, um, if you look at uh, small island development states, there, there, there are numerous code benefits to uh, the use of e-mobility. Maybe now with having some sort of storage uh, in the form of EV batteries, um, that could enable a higher share of uh, renewable power uh, on the, in, in, in these uh, island, island grid systems. Um, <clears throat> now on the other side, of course, there are a lot of challenges. So many African countries are not yet ready to untap the benefits of e-mobility. Um, there's generally a, a lack of awareness and capacity uh, within decision makers, in government, in industry, in finance, basically all across uh, the value chain. Um, there's an absence or a lack of national and local strategies, roadmaps and planning instrument, instruments which formulate targets and milestones for the introduction and upscaling of e-mobility. That is very important because without having clear targets, you don't know uh, what to aspire for, where to, what to work for. So uh, these, these, these targets can really help uh, planning the introduction and then also help mobilize uh, uh, funds. Um, we still see a lack of adequate um, electric vehicles for use under the conditions we meet in, uh, in African countries. This is in particularly true for, uh, for electric two and three wheelers. Um, let's say in, the Asian, uh, in Asia, we already have millions, hundreds of millions of electric two wheelers, but now they are not generally um, used the same way as they are used in uh, African countries, for example. In African countries, um, these two wheelers are uh, mostly used as taxis, so they have long uh, daily driving distances, and they have they they use uh, they have to carry uh, big loads, and they need to have a minimum power uh, because uh, they want they are they are uh, sort of uh, uh, targeted to flow with uh, with traffic, and we don't want to have another slow vehicle on the road. Um, <clears throat> There is, of course, lack of trained personnel to operate and maintain electric vehicles. Yeah, we need to have the technicians on the ground to, uh, who know how to deal with uh, repairing electric motorcycles, repairing electric buses. Um, and there's still a lack of proof of concepts. Yeah? We need to have more demonstrations, projects, and of course, we have uh, now these good initiatives with Solutions Plus, also with the, what, what UNEP is doing on the Global Electric Mobility Program. But there's still very much more to be done. Um, to improve, for example, by uh, business models and to basically uh, uh, develop financial products to finance e-mobility projects and to cover the higher upfront cost of EVs. Um, <clears throat> now, that next slide is providing a brief overview um, on what's been done on the policy side already and on the implementation side already in in, in, in a couple of African countries. Now that slide is based on also some analysis uh, done by ICCT. It's been complemented with some uh, own uh, analysis. And uh, I would say it's, it's far from being comprehensive. Um, so it is just a start, but what we see here is that still quite a, uh, quite a couple of countries, I think it's 15 or something like this on this slide deck, um, have already quite some uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 incentives or uh, or plans or or uh, projects in place to um, to uh, foster the uptake of electric mobility. Uh, that includes um, 
tax breaks, for example, what we see in Kenya, what we see in Mauritius, what we see in other countries like Rwanda or Seychelles, either on the importation of electric vehicles or through, um, let's say, reduced electricity tariffs, which play really a big role in making e-mobility more attractive. Um, we actually see that in most of these countries, there is uh, some attempts to bring charging infrastructure on the ground. We have a lot of um, we have a lot of uh, efforts to manufacture and assemble vehicles. Um, this is actually very interesting to see on this slide uh, how many countries already embarked on uh, uh, in one way or the other um, with manufacturing and assembling uh, electric vehicles. And uh, in, in, in most of the cases, this is actually electric to three wheelers. Um, and then there's already uh, also quite a, quite some quite some EVs on on the ground, either through shared mobility or through bus fleets or to some other special fleets, uh, for example, government fleets, these sort of things. Um, but of course, uh, this is just the starting point. Um, <clears throat> so there's a strong need for more projects and programs to address these challenges and to uh, benefit uh, from the opportunities. Now, the good thing is that this COP, the COP26, the Conference of the Parties, which will take place in November in Glasgow this year, will have a strong focus on transport, so that is very good. While the transport sector had been neglected in, in past years, now it's very good to see that transport actually made it on the big stage. And uh, also that there is more and more of that understanding that uh, 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 climate targets will not be achieved only with, uh, uh, let's say, the global north, um, working on cleaning up the transportation sector, but actually the understanding that really the global south is very is is, is crucial in achieving uh, climate targets is now is now there and it's uh, getting more and more popular and uh, uh, this is this is very important because this means that more resources will be mobilized yeah? more uh, more attention will be brought to projects on e-mobility in Africa for example yeah? now that is a very good thing um, <clears throat> now. With that in mind, uh, we, 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 we as uh, UNEP with, with UEMI, we are working on uh, 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 launching a new program. Um, that program has a lot of country projects, has regional elements and has global elements. Uh, I mean, as part of uh, the joint uh, Solutions Plus UNEP Global Electric Mobility Program, we are now having 50 uh, e-mobility projects in uh, in countries uh, around the uh, low and middle income countries in, 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 in the global south. Um, these uh, projects might, might uh, very well be some small projects where we are uh, supporting a country in getting a certain policy right. Um, but then uh, with the support of the chef, for example, now there will be a lot of more sizable projects which will actually build, uh, work on all uh, on the entire menu of options when it comes to e-mobility. Um, with uh, the support of the GF, there will be um, the a setup of four regional supply and investment platforms, of which one will be in Africa, that one will be hosted by UNEP. I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next minutes. Um, there will be four global electric mobility working groups, which will be uh, implemented in uh, collaboration with the International Energy Agency. And here again, the objective is on the one side to talk uh, or to provide global advocacy, to uh, work on uh, policy proposals, to see what is working well in other countries, what can be transferred to, uh, to, to for example, uh, countries in Africa. And uh, of course, very important, that entire uh, part of global advocacy, bringing the theme, bringing the issue of e-mobility in low and middle income countries to um, the donors and to the big stages so that we can uh, raise the funds which are necessary to make the transition happening. Um, <clears throat> just a bit more about those global working groups. There will be four of them, one on electric light duty vehicles, one in electric two and three wheelers, one on electric heavy duty vehicles, which is going to include buses and freight, and one on charging infrastructure, batteries and grid integration. As I just said, it's going to be jointly implemented by UNEP and the International Energy Agency. And uh, yes, this will be a forum to uh, formulate what is needed to uh, develop uh, uh, knowledge products which shall be used in the country projects to basically uh, 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 
don't invent the wheel all the time um use make use of of of, of the knowledge which has already been created in uh, front running countries and uh, basically support the development of uh, an e-mobility ecosystem in, uh, in, in, in countries across uh, the world and in Africa. Um, as I just said, uh, uh, part of this program will be uh, the uh, establishment of uh, so-called support and investment platforms. And indeed, uh, the African uh, support and investment platform will be launched on Thursday, uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, 29th of September. Um, as part of the Africa Climate Week. Um, and again, uh, here it's about uh, two main objectives. One is to creating uh, these, these sort of regional or continental pre, uh, communities of practice where we, will, we, we, we bring all, all e-mobility projects together to uh, basically exchange on lessons learned. Um, on the other side, these uh, platforms will be the main uh, mechanism to uh, to, to, to uh, implement trainings and capacity building. And uh, we are now working on uh, uh, developing a schedule for the next uh, three, four years, uh, whereby um, uh, uh, broader issues of e-mobility, but also very targeted and detailed issues of e-mobility will be discussed. Um, and then uh, one very uh, important uh, last point is the, is the establishment of an e-mobility marketplace. Um, where we want to bring together um, e-mobility projects with the private sector and the finance sector to basically um, develop new projects, develop big, bigger projects, um, develop, uh, develop replication projects, um, these sort of things. Now, <clears throat> that slide is providing an overview about the country projects which we are having currently on the ground in, uh, in Africa or which are uh, going to be uh, started in the next couple of uh, weeks and months. Um, so what we can see here is that there is actually a, a, a pretty big focus on, on East African countries. Uh, I mean, you see that we have, oh, Sierra Leone is not an East African country. I'm uh, just, just slipped through and doing the, uh, <laughs> doing the, uh, the table, of course, Sierra Leone needs to be under West Africa, but anyway, um, there's a lot of things going on in East African countries, but yes, there's also a lot of things going on in West African countries. And maybe it's also just a little bit uh, due to the fact that uh, UNEP is uh, based in Nairobi, that we have a better understanding of what's going on in West Africa. Um, we have also, uh, together with UNIDO, projects to go in, which, which are going to be started in North Africa, in uh, Tunisia. And then uh, uh, in South Africa, there's also quite uh, a couple of things going on in uh, the countries uh, shown in the table. Now, again, in these projects, uh, as I said, we want to work on the whole menu of uh, things which, uh, which, which are related to e-mobility. That means carry out comprehensive stakeholder consult consultations and we provide access to a global network of, of, of partners and experts. Um, we help uh, with uh, the establishment of institutional frameworks. Um, we are going to work on e-mobility strategies and roadmaps. Um, we are doing all sorts of studies and hopefully this all is helpful to, um, to, uh, to, to, to bring e-mobility on the ground. Um, now, going into a bit more detail, coordination strategy and policy. Yeah? So what, what we see uh, or what we think is important is to make sure um, countries have uh, 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 sort of bodies which are aware of what is going on in the country, uh, which are championing e-mobility projects in the country, which bring together all relevant stakeholders. Because as for uh, other transport projects, transport um, is reliable is relying on the cooperation of a lot of uh, government uh, stakeholders. So we need to have. Um, of course, uh, Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Energy in the loop. We need to have, um, let's say, uh, those, uh, those responsible for, for taxation. We need to have those responsible for uh, standardization, for regulation. We need to have, uh, we need to have cities in, the, uh, in, 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 those, uh, in, in those bodies. We need to have, uh, depending on the structure of the country, we need to have counties. We need to have all sorts of um, uh, stakeholders being aware of what is happening and working together. 
And then on the other side, of course, it's uh, important that uh, the private sector also uh, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, creates its voice, for example, through the establishment of associations. So these are these are things where uh, we think it's important to work on coordination. Um, it is important to work on the targets. I think it's important to do regional, national, and city e-mobility strategies and roadmaps for the reasons I uh, mentioned before. Um, it's important to put in place uh, urban transport planning instruments, especially when it comes to uh, how to actually get uh, the power to uh, to the vehicles, how to how to uh, anticipate hundreds or thousands of electric two and three wheelers coming in the next years, um, and what needs to be done on that. And um, and uh, last but not least, it's very important to also look at uh, EV industry development. Um, <clears throat> of course, it's 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 uh, very important to work on this policy and incentives uh, framework. Yeah. So what is uh, how how do we define parameters uh, to actually uh, uh, import uh, uh, electric vehicles? Import electric vehicle parts, make it make it make it practical, make it smooth. Um, how can we uh, work on let's say a reduction or wave of input duties um, for EVs or EV supply equipment? How can we work on uh, reduced VAT? Uh, how can we sort of make uh, uh, upfront costs of electric vehicles? Uh, more accessible. Um, so also, uh, also the the, um, uh, the tarification of electricity is very uh, is, is very uh, is a very important point. Um, having a let's say different uh, differentiated uh, price tariffs for end consumer electricity, let's say for new and for normal household applications, and uh, let's say for EV charging, if there's a let's say significant uh, price difference in between then this is very good because of course it makes the operation of electric vehicles more um, economical last but not least there is um, local incentives playing a role um, free parking access of restricted areas that's basically all the ingredients we see uh, from uh, successful e-mobility uh, promotion in, uh, in, in in the global north uh, and uh, basically it's the same principles which shall be applied in countries in Africa. Now also, um, there's a need for some uh, minimum regulation, for example, with regards to safety standard, when we're talking about um, the EV charging infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> now, I believe what we need and maybe want to contribute in the coming years is to provide more targeted analysis. Um, for example, when it comes uh, to electric vehicles, there will be new areas which will need to be uh, thought about. Um, how are we regulating the importation of used EV vehicles? How, we are, how, how, we are, how are we making sure that um, used electric vehicles coming, for example, to the African continent um, are still of use? And uh, uh, this is not becoming a dump site for, for, for let's say, broken batteries. Huh? That is, I think, a very important point. What is the exact value of retrofitting? Where, where does retrofitting makes, uh, make sense? Where, does, where it doesn't make sense? Um, what will be the impact of accelerated um, uh, internal combustion engine vehicle phase out in the EU and, yep, and Japan on, for example, used vehicle imports to Africa? Um, and how can we, better, uh, uh, can we better untap the potential of EV assembly and manufacturing at scale? So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, work to be done, a lot of um, uh, data to be, uh, to be uh, crunched and uh, sort of uh, key findings to be distilled. Um, if you're looking at EV charging, so I think we need to have a better understanding of um, electric two and three wheeler charging schemes and business models, including the whole, let's say, the whole, uh, the whole menu of options, including overnight charging, including battery swapping, but maybe also including public fast charging. Um, <clears throat> so we need to uh, have. Uh, better analysis on what will be the impact of electric two and three wheeler charging at scale, um, especially if we, know, uh, if we go on the power uh, and transmission and distribution uh, system level where we then uh, look into, let's say, stages of, uh, of, of, of motorcycle and, and three wheeler drivers. Um, and uh, when, when this comes to scale, what, what will be the effects of uh, of, of, of the use of electricity and what needs to be done to basically um, make the transition smooth. Um, the same is true for um, the charging of buses. 
Um, and uh, of course, we want to see how we can integrate higher shares of renewable power, um, for example, through hypercharging uh, systems into uh, the, the, the entire uh, uh, use of electricity for electric vehicles. That is, for example, more, more important for many countries in West Africa, which have um, energy systems where um, often the use of, uh, of diesel generators uh, by the uh, big, big uh, industrial scale uh, power gen sets or also a lot of small scale um, backup uh, sort of generators are used for power generation. And uh, here, of course, the integration of renewable power generation and, and, and distribution makes it much, is, is much more important to make sure that uh, electric mobility is sustainable. Yeah? And again, uh, this point of off-grid charging electric two and three wheels and rural electrification, that is uh, also something a couple of uh, uh, countries with low uh, power access rates might want to might want to uh, learn more about see what is what is possible and what is not. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, things to be done around electric vehicle batteries. Huh? We need to start um, putting in place ideas and schemes on what to do with used EV batteries, huh? reusing them in other applications, for example, for energy storage repackaging them basically um, using uh, uh, old battery, battery packs and uh, 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 dismantling them using the cells, proving the, the cells, testing the cells and building new battery packs out of used uh, batteries. And uh, of course, there will be always uh, uh, a point at which uh, batteries will not be usable anymore. And then we need to think about how to recycle them and how to make sure that the materials which are contained in the batteries are going back into the value chain. And this now uh, looks into basically the, the, the entire issue of extraction of raw materials, sustainability and circularity. Um, <clears throat> one important thing, um, how to close the financing gap how to scale up from the first 50 to the first 500 EVs. I think now that is the point where, uh, where, where we are at the stage where this is now happening. Um, how to leverage the funds to actually make this possible. Um, I think uh, East Africa, um, Rwanda and Kenya are at the forefront of making this step. Um, if you look at the Kenyan uh, 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 e-mobility um, ecosystem, there are more than 20 companies already active in either assembling and manufacturing electric two and three wheelers, operating EVs and taxi and delivery fleets, developing charging infrastructure and swapping systems and uh, financing e-mobility projects. Um, we hope that the Africa Support and Investment Platform is playing a major role in leveraging the finance and in attracting investors to actually see what is happening on the ground and being convinced that this is a good, uh, uh, good thing to invest money in. Um, now, for example, uh, manufacturing Africa is just on the way of publishing an in-depth uh, in study um, estimating the economic potential of electric two and three wheelers in Africa and in East Africa, in Kenya. And uh, uh, this is a lot of information which can be adapted to other countries on the continent. And uh, we're just looking forward to um, having this uh, study be in public. And uh, yes, with that little outlook in, uh, uh, how 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 uh, let's say e-mobility could be it could play an enabling role for um electrification of remote areas um i i want to close my my overview and uh, give the floor to uh, the uh, organizer of the training thanks thank you alex that was a really good overview um, very interesting to especially see that the grid um, in East Africa is quite clean and it would be important later on in the panel to understand why this is important. And of course, you've mentioned the opportunities and challenges in rolling out e-mobility. And of course, there are opportunities for local innovators, policy opportunities, um, coordination strategy as well. And it's important as well to note that e-mobility is gaining traction in the African continent. Um, and we will be then, um, we do have some questions in the chat, which we will take during the panel discussion. Um, so thank you for that, Alex. Next, we move on to Katie, who will do um, an overview of immobility within the context of planning. Katie, if you could wave at us, are you there? Yes, yes, you can see me, right? 
Yes. All right. So I'm handing over to you. Um, yes, I'm sharing the screen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Sounds good. Okay, thank you, Judith. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think it was very interesting to hear the overview from Alex. Uh, it really gave us a pretty good um, view on what's happening in Africa. And I'm, I'm really happy to see that there is a lot going on um, on immobility e for e buses or two, three wheelers. And actually, I think Alex touched a little bit on the planning and policy framework. Uh, but uh, in this presentation, we will um, see that a bit more in detail so that we can understand um, uh, what are the policies and um, aspects in the planning that are needed for the a successful implementation of immobility. Um, so specifically, we will see three, three parts. Um, first, we will see the importance to have a comprehensive planning framework. So what is the importance of it? What are the benefits for the implementation of immobility? E then we will see uh, how uh, sustainable urban mobility planning can support mobility innovation. And then uh, we will briefly see a few methodologies and tools that can support the effective implementation of e-mobility. Okay, so going in the, on the first topic, um, SUMP, maybe you have heard about this term. SUMP, uh, it means, or it's, uh, it's the acronym of Sustainable Urban Mobility Planning. So how uh, sustainable urban mobility planning can be this framework and what are, what are the benefits for immobility, e right? So I'm sure most of you or some of you uh, are working in the transport sector or maybe energy sector and are maybe working in the government or in the private sector, but maybe mostly from the government uh, or I, I think from different sectors, we all face uh, many challenges on uh, planning transport, right? Mostly in emerging economies. So for example, old, uh, I mean, in Africa, also in South America, I am from Peru. So we all face these challenges in transport and urban mobility. Why? Because um, urban planning has become a very complex task, no? Uh, we know that the demands on transport is growing, population is growing, demands are growing, and sometimes, or many times, we are confronted with contradictory demands. So what do we mean by that? That we, we need to respond to the day-to-day -day, uh, needs while also thinking on the future, right? So we need to think, okay, we, I, we will take the decision today for something, but we can't lose uh, the view on the future, what impact is going to have in the future, right? So sometimes these, these decisions are really difficult to take and we, we don't know which could be the best, right? Because also for the future, it's difficult to see what could be the impact of specific uh, solutions, for example. So this is becoming complex every time and this makes our work even difficult, right? For these decisions, maybe to implement innovations such as e-mobility. And also uh, sometimes we are not sure, or maybe we don't have enough information on uh, all the impacts that some solutions will have on the economic, social, environmental aspects, and also to respond to the needs also on these areas, right? So this is something that we are facing now in our cities, and for this, we need, uh, we, uh, for the decisions that we have to take, uh, that, I, that as, as we said, is very difficult sometimes, um, it's very important to keep in mind that would be, it's, it would be really good to think always what kind of city do we want, right? So to have like a, an idea of what, which kind of city we would like to live in, and not only for us, but also for the future generations, no? for our children, and for the next generation. So what are we going to leave uh, to them, right? To the next generation. So we have seen that in the, in the last decades, um, population have grown and also because uh, government couldn't cope with it, 
urban sprawl has grown and also um, mobility, mobil the mobility system couldn't cope with this uh, growth, right? So sometimes the mobility um, um, services that we have, buses and so on, are the bad quality. They cannot um, cope with the demand. They cannot cover, you know, all the areas where people are living. And also the space is limited, as we know, in our cities. So all these, all these issues you know, uh, uh, leads to um, high traffic congestion in our cities. And this, more importantly, is harming our economy, right, in the cities, health, and the environment, right? So this is leading back to us, but with negative impacts, right? So because of this, many governments uh, in different regions in the world, and mostly also in emerging economies, they know the urgency to make um, transport more sustainable. <coughs> we now know that we need to make transport more sustainable to respond to all the different groups uh, that uh, there is in the society, right? Why? Because we want to grow economically. We also want to provide transport with equity, safety, and also improve our health, the environment, and the quality of life in our cities, right? So now we, we all are clear that we want that first. Okay, so in this, in this aspect, um, SUV or sustainable urban mobility planning creates all different benefits for our cities. Um, this approach is based on uh, common objectives, so agreed objectives among uh, key actors and use collaborative planning tools. So what it means that the key actors will work together to agree on a goal, on targets, on measures, and this will, this will also respond to most of the needs in the society and not you know, to a specific group or maybe a small group, right? So uh, we will see also this, uh, this uh, with this approach, we will see the implementation, we will be able to see the financing and monitoring also to uh, implement mobility measures. And uh, as we can see, I mean, SUMP or uh, sustainable or mobility planning and plans are being developed around the world in different countries. Um, yeah. Okay, so what is an SUV? I was telling you, right? This is this means sustainable urban mobility planning. Uh, and actually we refer here to a plan, you know, that we will develop for our cities that is integrated. You now these keywords are very important to reflect on them. So this plan is integrated. What it means that we will integrate all different modes of transport. So you're right, public transport, private, freight. Um, cyclists, pedestrian, right? And give them the importance, of course, following sustainability, right? This is a, stra a strategic plan. Why? Because we will define a vision for the future and a long-term uh, planning transport because we will see maybe uh, how the transport will look like in our cities for the next 20 years or 15 years, right? And we will set this target uh, um, or this um, vision for, for our cities. And we will define also clear goals and monitoring also for aiming to reach or to improve two main aspects. You know? First, accessibility and also quality of life. You know? So accessibility is very important because in this way, we will really ensure that people can really access more opportunities, right? And uh, more services, for example, right? So we are not focusing only on the implementation of just an infrastructure, regardless if the people can really access, if the people can really pay for it, right? So uh, this is very important. So to focus on accessibility and quality of life for the functional urban area. And this is based on a framework, on a policy framework, European policy framework, for SUMP, so this is this has, uh, I mean, some years already. This has um, started in 2019 uh, with a few studies on this on topic, and then on 2013, the first uh, guide uh, to develop SUMP was developed, and then uh, the first guidelines also was written in 2014. 
Uh, so since then, the European Commission, this is the, uh, here in Europe, the European Commission have supported this uh, approach uh, for cities to develop their sustainable mobility plans. No? Uh, so there were many projects that were, um, that were launched uh, so that they can use the methodology to apply. Uh, so since then, many, many cities uh, all, um, across Europe have applied the methodology and also it has become a requirement for funding. So cities need to apply and need to have a plan so that they can implement um, different measures on mobility. And actually in the last years, uh, it, this is also being used as a reference for uh, in international, uh, in other regions of the world, Latin America, I think we are using also uh, in Africa in some places. Uh, also in China, in, you know, so it's now a reference. Of course, it's a reference because it's a guide. So there will be things that need to be adjusted to the local context, right? But the important part here is that it has, uh, it has this, this methodology or this guide was developed uh, with the contributions of more than 150 experts. Uh, so it's actually, um, it uh, brings... Yeah, it brings all the different expertise and also the best practices and methodologies that cities can use to implement or to develop a more, um, a, a better plan, a more realistic plan in a way that it can be really implemented in the city, which is actually what we want, right? So um, what is the essence of SUP? SUP has eight principles. And this focus on, you can see them in the, on the screen. So this is, uh, for example, uh, these are kind of the basic pillars of uh, the methodology, right? Sometimes we don't need to really follow the methodology as it is, like all the steps, all the actions, right? Because it might not fit in all the contexts, like exactly, right? But uh, actually that's not, that's not really important, right? What, what we want is to have these basic pillars and to adjust to the context. So for example, we, will, we want to cooperate across boundaries. So we, have, we, we see sometimes in practice that the government departments, they work on their own. They don't coordinate, right, between each other, despite being all one organization. And, uh, and also uh, to the, for example, not only uh, internal in the government, but also external, you know? So there is no enough cooperation with private institutions, with the academia, you know, uh, and we are losing opportunities because of that, right? Also in the government, there should be cooperation between different levels, and that's, this is addressing that. We also want to involve citizens and, and stakeholders along the development of the plan and also implementation of policies, assessing current and future performance, we want to define also a long-term vision, right? And a clear implementation plan. We want to also integrate all different transport modes in the city, right? We know that we have all, the, all these different options, but they are not integrated, no? So this is also something important and uh, arrange monitoring and evaluation and also assure quality of what we are developing, right? So um, how can, SUMP supports mobility innovation. Uh, so in this case, immobility we know is new in our cities, is coming. There are so many things that we don't know about it, right? So uh, some of the things that Alex was explaining. Um, so these are a lot of specific aspects that we need to learn, right? And it's, it will be a process actually in our cities. But also we need an enabling environment, right? So we need some aspects in place so that the solutions could be implemented, right? So in this sense, SUMP could be this framework that we need to actually help immobility to be implemented. And this, uh, because this, uh, this could be adjusted to the context, right? It can help for uh, mobility innovation um, um, for the implementation of these measures. So in this case, uh, we, we could have in our cities different planning status. For example, we are developing, some of the cities have some 
um, experience developing master plans, for example. Other cities, they are uh, more, mostly focused on infrastructure, on uh, implementing large infrastructure projects. So it could be maybe BRTs, could be, um, I don't know, metros, I don't know. And then uh, maybe another, another also planning um, situation could be that we have different uh, sectoral planning, right? So for a specific aspects, we have special uh, uh, plans that are, you know, for targeting a specific aspect. So regardless where we are, SUP can help us uh, by um, helping us to integrate all these different sectoring plans, for example, or ensuring, for example, the strategic and uh, user-centric pers perspective, or also maybe um, strengthening the participatory and cooperation uh, aspect, you know, and involving the citizens much more, right, in our in our in our plans and also in our solutions. So actually, this methodology can help us and can give us this basis that we need to actually foster implementation. So we will set the, this basis so that we can uh, implement and then maybe help also to the solutions to actually kick off. Um, and uh, some of the uh, key aspects, for example, where uh, SUMP can help us would be on the on fostering this cooperation in, uh, across institutional boundaries. You know, as I said, um, it will help us to to have a better framework for cooperation, to exchange across level of levels of governments, and what this will bring us. This will help us to harmonize these different policies. Right? We might have, for example, it's very common that the transport and energy sectors are working separate. Right? And each of them are like their own goals, but for immobility, we need them to coordinate. We need we need to work uh, uh, in these two sectors together, and they need to cooperate and also find some synergies, right? And we can also re use better the resources. So this can help us also in this. So joint measures and also pooled resources and capacities, and also um, we will uh, we will have finally the, like a higher impact from our our solutions, right? And uh, another key thing is also the involvement of citizens and stakeholders. So this is very important. Uh, many, many cities have learned that uh, by involving the citizens and key actors through the development of plans and also in the implementation, it really helps for implementing, right? It really helps to to make real, you know, these solutions. Uh, so um, for SUMP, we always uh, find this very important as, a, as an element, you know, to, to involve the citizens and the stakeholders. Why? Because this will help us to, to, this will help our solutions to be better accepted, you know, by the others. And uh, also we will minimize political risks. Sometimes in our cities, uh, why, when we have different political leaders, the um, the priorities will change, right? So this will this will really um, be make things more difficult. For example, to follow a long term uh, vision, right? Because the priorities are changing every time. But this could be also a strategy that we can use so that we can minimize these risks. And also, we we can in this way we can consider different um, the different perspectives. So the, for the perspective from the different groups, which we wouldn't hear otherwise, right? And the solutions won't be adapted, for example, to people with disabilities, um, maybe to elder people. So it's important also in this way. And uh, uh, about this, for example, there is a really good example. Um, I think it was just launching in Ethiopia, the Bike Share homepage, uh, which is a platform. It's a web-based platform where people can um, help uh, plan through the cycling routes and they can also uh, provide suggestions. So actually we know that the COVID crisis has, it's, uh, with the COVID crisis it's difficult to have uh, workshops, right, on-site and everything, but we can find innovative solutions to actually engage with citizens, right, regardless of the limitations that we have. 
And another key thing is also developing all transport modes in an integrated manner. And we know that um, if we do that, we can prioritize also the sustainable modes, right? We want to integrate the, the um, public transport systems that we have with the infrastructure that we have for pedestrians, for cyclists. So this, this is still you know, a very important thing that we should do in our cities. And for this, for example, in SUMP, what we, what we uh, think is a good alternative is uh, to build pa uh, measure packages. So it means that we will put in a package different types of measures, which could be not only infrastructure, but could be regulation measures, promotion, technology, among others, so that they can help the implementation of the other, right? So this will help us also to, to achieve the shift to sustainable mobility. If we really can integrate them all modes, we can provide this uh, transport that we want to give with door-to-door -door transport, right? So, so this will help us in, this, in achieving this shift. And also we can maximize the synergies and also uh, the acceptability of the measures. So here we have an example of Marquina City in, in the Philippines. And they, what they did was to put this measure package to promote cycling, you know, so that also they can improve road safety. And they aim to integrate all these different uh, solutions they had, right? So that um, the shift can really be achieved. And finally, we will see the last part, which is on the methodologies and tools to support effective immobility implementation. And here, um, uh, this is a very interesting framework. So framework for strategic sustainable development, so SSD, uh, that will support decision making. Uh, so this helps uh, institutions and society and decision makers uh, to, to attain the long-term goals, right? So that uh, they can really base uh, their decisions on, on um, sustainable, sustainability principles. So it does by following five level, a five-level approach, as you can see, and it starts, starts with the understanding of the system as a whole. So we need to understand the system as a whole, also recognize the role of mobility you know, in, in the wider system and how this impacts urban development, environment, uh, quality of life, health, etc. You know, uh, this framework defines four sustainability principles addressing natural and social, physical and economic elements. In this way, we can guide you know, the definition of effective objectives to achieve sustainable mobility. On the strategic level, uh, the methodology presents a backcasting principle. So it, what it means that we will set first the goal and then we will try to find the means how to reach this goal. So going back, right? And um, uh, we will envision the future, right? And then we will see how to reach it. Uh, so this is an effective way, for example, to handle uncertainties. If we know where we want to go, right, right from the beginning, uh, we can then um, adjust or adapt, right? Also depending on the situation that we have so that we reach there. And on the action level, the framework also takes an, uh, an operational approach you know, to prioritize strategic actions toward the targets that we have set. Uh, and finally, it addresses also the need for contextualized tools. So that's very important, right? Everything that we use, the tools, the methodologies, the guides need to be contextualized, right? We all know that the, the context is so different from one place to another, so that's important, right? And also, uh, we need to monitor the actions so that we can reach the objective. And um, um, so uh, when we talk about planning for immobility and also the, the policy goals, it's important to, to, to see this aspect. For example, the energy, the potential that immobility has to reduce emissions is very important, right? It's huge, but this will depend also on the um, source of the energy, if the energy is coming from renewable uh, sources, right? 
So I think in that in that sense, for example, it was as as you did mention, it was very interesting to see that in the case of Kenya, for example, it is actually coming from renewable sources. And I think in most of the cases, we really need to make sure of that. Otherwise, we are not really um, we might not uh, reduce emissions as as much as we would like, right? So this is important thing. The space distribution as well. So about the space, we know that the space that we have in our cities is limited, right? So if we, if we have electric, electric vehicles and conventional vehicles, the, both of them use the same space. So we need to check this and maybe uh, e-mobility is not enough, right? It's not like a solution on its own and it won't address all the issues as a standalone solution, right? So we need to see it from a wider perspective. And also about congestion. If all, as we said, if all cars um, use more or less the same space, if we shift, right, the conventional cars to electric cars, we will only have cleaner congestion. <laughs> so that's not what we want, right? So we really need to, um, immobility should be seen as a complementary measure of a, of a um, a bigger plan that we have for our for our cities that will combine, of course, other measures as we know for um, sustainable mobility, like you know motorized transport, also promoted public transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? And also the safety, you no. Know, so um, e-mobility or electric cars might not might not uh, maybe address the safety issue in our cities. So we have to see, of course. You know, what else can we do so that we can really address the issues that we have? And for um, supporting also the shifts in our cities, we can also use this other framework that maybe some of you have heard about avoid shift improve framework, which actually will, um, we will in this way avoid or reduce the need for motorized travel first, right? And then we will, okay, we will think about shifting to environmentally friendly modes. And also we will improve energy efficiency of transport modes. So this is important to, to keep, you know, this bigger picture of our city and, and then also to find which are the measures that we can actually um, pursue in our cities. And as you can see here, there are uh, many cities already that are developing roadmaps, roadmaps for e-mobility. And in the framework of sustainable urban mobility planning, so many cities in Europe, also in other parts of the world, in Latin America, for example, in Asia, and it's good to know that also in Africa, uh, soon, I think we will have also strategies. So it could be a strategy on its own, or could be also integrated in the SMP of the city, you know? So this is just a few examples that shows you that many, many cities are already doing that. And the possibilities of integration in mobility strategies in SUP are actually wide. As you can see, we can integrate them in different ways, in a horizontal model, sectoral, societal way. And for this, if we want to see more, you can check out our uh, guides on electrification and SUP, which is uh, one of the set of guides that we have developed on and you will see more in detail how to integrate e-mobility on, um, uh, on the sustainable urban mobility planning in your cities. And finally, important to mention the context condition. This is a uh, really key, right? It's not, I think it's, I think we many, most of us already have uh, reflected that uh, we cannot really copy and paste we cannot really think that if something works somewhere else will work in our cities. So it's very important to see what do we have in our cities and what do we need? Maybe some more norms, maybe regulations, maybe foster industry, and then really understand that and then see what are the things that we need to improve maybe in some of these aspects so that we can foster immobility in our cities. So that's... Um, my from my side thank you back to you judith thank you katie um a very interesting presentation and i love how you made the very strong connection between immobility and planning i think i will steal the statement from you if we do not have a planning intervention then we will just have clean congestion 
by, by electrifying cars. And that's very interesting. Um, of course, we do need to check how we plan our cities, especially in Africa. And with e-mobility taking traction on the continent, this will be very important. I see there are quite a number of questions as well still um, in the chat, and we will then take them during the panel discussion and Q&A. Welcome everyone. Um, we see your questions, we see your introductions. Really good to have you. Quite a wide participation from all over the continent and other parts of the world. So I will then introduce Amos Mwangi of UN Environment, who will give us a case study from the African context to show us what is happening um, in terms of immobility. Amos, are you with us? You could wave at us. Yes, Judith. Uh, good to see you. Good, uh, see you. good evening to everyone. I'm happy to see such a diverse audience and uh, actually very happy about the other discussions that we've had. As you say, the, uh, we have quotable quotes. I'm not sure I'm going to provide one, but let's see. <laughs> All right, so um, I'd like to take us down a different route from what we have uh, already had. And um, so this presentation, we'll, we want to look at how we have practically looked at uh, rolling out two wheelers in, in Africa and specifically in Kenya and Uganda. Um, one of the things I would like to say is this is, this is more um, our, our perspective as MENA. Um, just to give us a brief background, we, had, we got some funding from the BMEEC uh, back in 2016, and this was to help the integrating two and three wheelers in urban which I know Katie has mentioned about a lot about integration, integration of mo mobility in, in the urban perspective in the mobility plan. So this was part of that to try to see how we can uh, facilitate countries, developing countries, to introduce uh, electric two and three wheelers in urban cities. And uh, so this project was to try to look at the uh, cities in the Southeast Asia and cities in East Africa. Um, that is. Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda in East Africa, and then Philippines, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam in on the other side of South, Southeast Asia. Uh, so what this pro project did, or what we've been able to do, is to look at the baseline um, setup of the countries, looking at their fleet uh, compositions, what what scale do we have in terms of the numbers of the, of the vehicles that ha are uh, are registered in these countries. And then now look at going to the next step of doing a demonstration of uh, this electric mobility to just provide a proof of proof of concept. Uh, Alex mentioned earlier it's the necessity in the EV space to uh, provide a proof of concept that actually this technology can really work for for Africa and for uh, similar countries across the world. So this uh, the demonstration part was to bring the proof of concept and also create a lot of awareness and uh, drew as much learnings from from from, from this uh, demonstration so what we did is we partnered with a company in china who were gracious to offer some units some, some units and actually 100 units and 99 of which were deployed to uh, partners and um, you will see from the images on the right uh, we had some assembly training uh, because we got the unit as knocked down, knocked uh, semi knocked down unit. So what we did is uh, have all the partners who are involved in Kenya, especially, to come together, go through the intricacies, the technic technical specifications, the technical um, considerations, even as we're doing the assembly of the of the unit. And uh, after that training that happened uh, in February, all of, all of the partners were able to now go with the units and set them up into functional units. Um, thereafter, in uh, March, uh, March, and, uh, March for Kenya and April for Uganda, we did the launches of the, of the demonstration pilots so that um, what would happen is that all the partners who have, have been given this, uh, this unit would go with them to their, their various use cases 
and work with them as they would do, they would, they would the internal combustion engine. So what we have is uh, we have Sustainable Transport Africa as the lead um, implementer or the one that's, that's supporting the implementation. So offering um, support in terms of the logistics of import, transportation, uh, managing the, the pilot and all. Um, just to just give you a bit of the information that we got or the data that or stats that we got from the baselining uh, part of the project. You see for both Kenya and Uganda, there is quite uh, a drastic increase in the number of uh, uh, electric, uh, sorry, not electric, but just motorbikes being registered. Um, for Kenya, these two wheelers sector or segment is actually the registration are, are much more than uh, um, the vehicles, the light duty vehicles that have been imported. If you look at uh, data from back in 2016, and I think uh, engineer Opera, I saw you on, on the audience, you can, you can give more insights, insights to this, but what happened is that uh, back in 2016, 2017, the numbers that were being registered annually for two wheelers uh, overtook the light duty vehicles and they've continued to progress like that. The same thing for Uganda, uh, somewhere people have quoted it as a place where there's the highest increase in the uh, in, in, uh, two wheeler segment across the world. You see 17% annual growth rate. Then on the same case uh, for the two countries and this would be mirrored uh, in several other countries in, in the continent. We have a large um, renewable electricity generation capacity. Um, Alex mentioned for Kenya is 85%. Uganda is in the similar similar scale. Um, one of the other things that was uh, found out from the study is that we, we did in this line is that for, for these two countries, Uganda and Kenya, we have a, a surplus electricity generation capacity. That is according to the data back in 2018. Um, an interesting thing was that if you are to add, um, for example, for Kenya, if you are to add uh, 200,000 units of uh, electric uh, bikes, you will not even uh, hit 5% of, of, of the this surplus that we're talking about. So um, this was part of the things that we used as a basis of setting up the demonstration. So once again, what I mentioned is that the demonstration setup was to draw as much learning as much lessons from this to create awareness to um, run these units and sort of provide a proof of concept and then now be able to use this as a basis of proposing uh, better quality, better safety, better uh, specs or uh, guidelines in, into, into introducing this uh, fleet segment of electric tools. So what we did is we received uh, 99, uh, 99 units, as I mentioned, 100 units, 99 were deployed. Um, for Kenya, we got 49, and then for, for Uganda, there were 50. Now this um, units were, in Kenya were distributed in Karura Forest, Karura Forest which is, uh, Karura Forest is an urban uh, forest con conservator, where, uh, sh should I say, they call it the lands of Nairobi. Uh, where it's like one of the green spaces in Nairobi where you can actually go and experience the greenery, experience the forest. And for this, there is a, an organization that manages, that actually monitors the whole area. So the, the scouts in this organization use this, these bikes, the five bikes, to monitor um, monitor the, 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 the loggers, the illegal loggers that would, would come and actually spoil the greenery. For the Kenya Power, it's a utility company. So what they do is they use a unit to um, to just go around the, the reading meters, reading the power meters to see to, to find the, the meter readings. Then for the Kisumu side, the Kisumu County, it's a subnational government. So what they do is that they use the city inspectorate to just carry out routine routine monitoring. And for power hive, they use this as a on the on the Taxi fleet. So Powerhead is an energy company, but they work closely with the border borders. So the units that they receive, they have rolled them out or deployed them in the taxi fleet. On the Uganda side, what we see is also they had a quite some different use case and different uh, geographical distribution of the units that they have. Uh, the main uh, demonstration was run, is run by International University of East Africa. But they also have like a control unit where 
the Uganda system has installed uh, GPS trackers where they're able to, mo to monitor where all the units are and uh, be, be able to collect data. There's also the Clean Air Initiative where they, they, ha they have some units just for um, routine travel within the office. There's Green Uganda through Glovo, which is a delivery company. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a delivery company. And on the flip side, there is a ginger rice cream. This is a rice cream uh, in Uganda where they've also rolled out this unit. So as I was saying, this is a demonstration setup which looks at both uh, different use cases and different geographical setups with different elevations. Um, some places are uh, generally uh, flat, others are hilly. So it allows us to get quite some, some, some details in terms of the uh, performance and functionality of this bike. Um, so the units we got, um, we got two different types of units. One is uh, has the engine mounted on the hub and another one that is sensor mounted. Um, just allowed us to see how um, the, the, the consumers or the people who are riding the operators get, get to experience this, this um, unit. So I, I need to say at this point that we got units that have uh, pretty small batteries, two kilowatt hour batteries. There are so many other uh, private players within Kenya, especially, and even across the continent who uh, worked on these uh, units and modified them, tried to fit them to, to the local context and the durability and the, 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 the use cases where they, they are really pushed. So this is pretty a, a, it is a pretty small battery and maybe may not be able to match up to the internal combustion engine, but it still is, was, was a good one for our, our use case and, uh, and our, our demonstration. So for this one, we expected a range of 50 to 60 kilometers and charging is through the normal, normal socket. So there's no special charging equipment. We didn't have sw swapping stations. So all of these ones have been uh, operated basically on charge, ride, uh, get back to the, to the spot and charge and, 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 and on and on. So just a bit of a drill down on the partners we had for, for Kenya and a bit of Uganda. So these are some of the metrics that we measured. The longest trip that this uh, Karura forest uh, bikes did was 44 kilometers. And you would understand because uh, the forest uh, is not such a long, uh, such a wide place. So uh, patrolling will not be uh, that, that intense. So the longest trip they did was 44 kilometers. The average charge time was 35 hours. Once again, depending on the, the amount of depletion of the charge because of the distance covered. And then the maximum speed, 65 kilometers per hour. Um, the, the, the weight, um, the weight was 162 maximum weight that was carried. Once again, when I'm talking about this, these are some of the metrics that we are trying to look for so that we can uh, measure the performance of the, of the bikes. And for this uh, use case, the major challenge was the long charging time, um, which would be negotiable, but yeah, the long charging time. Uh, the way the, the, these units were set up, they had, some of them had some electrical faults and structural inconsistencies here and there. But one of the biggest advantages that they gave were the fuel cost saving. So uh, because it's electrical, uh, electric charging, the cost of uh, charging is probably less than half of uh, a similar unit that would be fueled. And then the silence in patrolling, because if you, if you are trying to patrol and um, there's someone who is felling trees, if you approach with an ICE the equivalent is going to be so much noise that's made and they, you will notify them from afar that you're coming. So the silence with this one suits the purpose uh, very well. <clears throat> for Kisumu County, as I mentioned, it's, they are being used for the uh, city inspectorate to just do their routine monitoring. As you can see, the range, average range was 45 kilometers. The charge, uh, charging time was a bit longer. They achieved a, a bit higher speeds than uh, what uh, what was in Karura, 68 kilometers per hour, and a bit more weight, 174 uh, kgs. But then uh, another thing that they mentioned was longer charging time, and the, the maximum speed was a bit limiting. I guess as we compare the equivalent ICE, uh, ICE equivalent. So 
But one of the things that they mentioned also, there are big weak fuel cost savings for them, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, desirable. Uh, for Kenya Power, uh, once again, I mentioned it's the mission leaders who are using this one. The longest trip, 56 kilometers, the average range 44, 44 kilometers, highest speeds, again, you see it's different, uh, 73 kilometers per hour. And then, so what, uh, for this use case, one of the things that they, they do, the meter readers, is that they frequent, they, they move to many, many stops, uh, many uh, houses to read the meters, the, the power meters. So what happened is, because of this limited uh, range that uh, was produced for this for this unit, um, they were not able to use them more because uh, they had to recharge at some point. So uh, once again, still learning about this and, and seeing the effect of the limited range and maybe looking at how possibly we'll be able to um, uh, go over that, that kind of a challenge. Um, one of the major benefits again, fuel cost savings. And because this is a utility company, um, they are supplying the power. It just makes absolute sense for them to, to use this electric um, two-wheelers to carry out the business because that would mean basically that they're, 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 they would cut the whole cost of uh, purchasing uh, the fossil fuels. Um, on the Uganda side, an exception, I would say the longest trip they did on a single charge was 100 kilometers, or quite interesting. Um, one, and the average range was 71 kilometers, which is again, uh, very different from what we are seeing in Kenya. The charging times are similar because they are five to six hours maximum speed, despite the, <laughs> despite the rated um, uh, maximum speed of the bike, you see a bit, it, it's moving uh, beyond, beyond what is expected, which is quite interesting. And then uh, the challenges, which is similar to what we have in Kenya, uh, there are long charging times, electric faults in some units and, and, and breakages here and there. But then a big benefit were the, were the fuel cost savings and, and maintenance of course. So um, so what's the, what are the next steps? Uh, so the demonstrations are still ongoing. That's why we see, we said we are, we are providing preliminary uh, updates. The demonstration has been going up to March 2021. So we are going to be collecting and analyzing uh, the data with a bit more uh, detail. So this is just preliminary and we may not be able to, to like ascertain the specific reasons why things have gone uh, in a certain way, but we will be analyzing this more and more. And uh, you should be on the lookout for what, what we, we get from this. So um, most important, the demonstration partners have highlighted that there is a saved for fuel cost. I think we saw from all of the partners that they said, they mentioned that there are fuel cost savings. So this definitely is a technology that works. Uh, granted, there needs to be there needs to be a bit of tweaking here and there in terms of uh, quality, in terms of um, um, uh, durability, in terms of the range, and in terms of providing solutions here and there where which would be able to overcome these challenges. <clears throat> so, um, but I mentioned also that there are the private sector players who have already gone far beyond what we have done and, and really done a lot in terms of, of uh, tweaking these units and giving superior products, which uh, maybe they mentioned in the, in the charts, but they, which would be able to provide um, something that is feasible uh, for longer. So uh, as part of the next steps, we also, would want to produce a document that sort of gives guidelines on um, how to introduce two and three wheelers, what to check, what to not, what not to accept as a minimum, and uh, also what to look at in terms of safety and and uh, and such kind of things. We're also working with the Kenya Bureau of Standards to develop standards for safety, for charging, for uh, you know, the, 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 the things that we are identifying from this uh, pilot that needs to be addressed. Um, just a bit of a turn. One of the things that we have looked also at also is the socioeconomic dimension of this two and three wheeler sector. And it's very interesting to see that this sector employs 400,000 Kenyans for, for, for Kenya. The recent study that was done by the Flown Initiative. And this 400,000 
uh, Kenyan um, have dependence or they support uh, a population of 2.4 million Kenyans, which is quite an interesting statistic. Uh, the significant it's significant that uh, this would be a proper uh, avenue for youth uh, employment, especially. And you see, uh, there's also the element of manufacturing, where there's a lot of a lot um, many 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 individuals have been employed by this manufacturing or assembly of two and three wheelers. There's a retail part, there's a maintenance part. You can see the numbers uh, that are outlined there, and this is for just the two and three wheeler sector. So there's a lot. A lot, a lot of potential in this sector. Um, we also looked at an element of the gender uh, perspective and how um, these two and three riders are, as it, as it is right now. And you see, only in terms of inclusivity, only 11% of the riders are female. And the interesting part was was also that all these uh, female riders are, who are interviewed have said that they had some sort of harassment and there was a lot of gender bias in, in this uh, in this uh, in the experience as uh, riders of two and three wheelers and they also they also mentioned that there's physical harassment there's been incidences of physical harassment here and there but it's just interesting how there is a lot of uh, gender in, imbalance and uh, the inclusivity question is quite uh, leaves a lot to, to be said so a lot remains to be done, uh, just given as a snippet of what we've been able to gather over the last few months. But I'm happy to engage even as we continue with the, with, with the session. I'm leaving a bit of time. I see we are uh, pressed for time. So let's leave a bit of time for our engagement and questions. But otherwise, I'm happy to have had this opportunity. Back to you, Judith. Thank you, Amos. Um, very good to see that e-mobility is actually working on the ground and there, there are real life use cases. So we're not just um, talking about hypothetical situations, but it's actually being implemented. And yes, um, your, I mean, my, my quotation from you comes from your last slide actually on the gender gap. And you do say that a lot remains to be done in terms of integrating women in e-mobility. This is very important and I look forward to discussing that. And of course, it's interesting that you have showed us how e-mobility results in employment, and there are different use cases for e-mobility um, being used in the forest, being used um, with, by utility companies. So there are different use cases. Thank you for that, Amos. And we will be seeing you shortly um, in the panel discussion and the Q&A session. So very quickly, I'd like to just um, share once more the program just for those of you who have joined us um, in, in the middle of the program. We have gone through um, a current status of immobility in Africa. We have also discussed immobility within the context of planning and policy. And we have had a case study of two and three wheelers in Kenya and Uganda. Now at this point, we will be proceeding to the Q&A session and we will ask all our speakers to please have their videos on and be ready to answer some of these questions. Of course, um, keep the questions coming. We are still manning the chat, so keep the questions coming. And I will ask Emily and Edmund to assist me um, in going through some of the questions that have been asked. So maybe we can start with Emily and I will stop sharing at this point. Thanks a lot, Judith, uh, for this very promising uh, start of the week um, and for the very in instructive presentations and uh, stimulating questions that you um, um, added in the chat. Um, so leaving you a few minutes to add a few more, I just would like to come back to uh, a few input that was added during the presentations. Um, so we asked about the challenges that you face, especially if you are an e-mobility company. Um, we had some input from Solar Taxi um, saying that there are still some difficulties in getting incubators or investors on board. Um, from Consalva Msivwa from Dar Salaam, um, we had a pretty similar assessment of the challenges that Alex uh, from UNEP mentioned. Um, including uh, the large flow of used cars from Japan and other countries, a uh, lack of awareness about electric vehicles, um, a lack of technical knowledge as well. 
Um, I would like here to mention that uh, we can uh, provide some support through Solutions Plus and, uh, and the DEF through UNEP. Um, so our email addresses will be shared in the chat. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, if you would like to have a bilateral discussion with us. Um, I'm not spending more time on this and I think that we can start uh, the discussion um, with one question to Alex from UNEP. Um, the question originates from Sheikh Hamed Tunis from EPR Sierra Leone um, asking, energy is a major issue in Africa. How do we solve this in the immobility quest? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sheikh, for, for, for asking this question. Um, so I think, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, we need to really have a differentiated look at, at this question. Yeah? And uh, I think uh, there are a lot of countries where um, provision of power is uh, 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 less of a problem. There are a lot of countries where provision of power is more of a problem and there's uh, always sort of very specific uh, specific backgrounds uh, to that. For example, in the case of Kenya, Kenya has a 30% overcapacity of electric uh, power generation. And, and here, uh, that there's, there's actually a, a, a need to, to look for demand for electricity. Yeah? Now, I believe in, in, in many other countries, and uh, I think Sierra Leone is one of these countries where um, the picture is uh, uh, a bit different, where actually there is a lack of, of power supply and uh, and the demand for power and the access to electricity is still, uh, or the, the, the need to access to electricity is still much, much larger. Now, really, as I said in, in, in the presentation, I believe there is um, value in uh, looking into off-grid power generation, um, uh, applications yeah um of course it's always good to expand national power grids and to uh, make sure that um main uh, sort of or, or to make sure that the uh, that the big part of the population has actually access to grid power but then i think it's really necessary to look into the exact costs and benefits of what is a viable pathway into the future whether it, it makes sense to um sort of uh, build long and costly uh, uh, transmission lines to uh, to to, to uh, connect remote areas if on the other side there's actually a pretty uh, how to say a pretty valuable resource base natural resource base having uh, having uh, solar power or solar radiation radiation which is high having uh, uh, wind energy access having sort of uh, being endowed with natural resources, which maybe uh, allows for other uh, for other um, for other ways, and to look into smaller scale applications and decentralized uh, power generation. Yeah, and here uh, I think there's there's value in, in in electric mobility as on the one side it can bring power demand to regions or to areas where there is very little power demand. I mean, in very remote areas, uh, power demand is 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 not is not high because uh, people actually not use a lot of power. I mean, it's for mobile uh, mobile phone applications, for uh, maybe some information app applications, for for cooling, for some sort of agricultural applications. But it's really not enough, uh, not not a lot. Now, if uh, that demand can be increased by bringing uh, local fleets of electric motorcycles or electric three wheelers, then I think or that there might be there might be value in combining this and uh, sort of creating a more stable uh, business model for off-grid power generation but then of course that's all that's all uh, difficult there's a lot of uh, things which need to be understood how can you store electricity i mean there are uh, times of uh, times of rain there are times of gray uh, of gray uh, of gray sky um which significantly reduces the um, efficiency of solar solar panels now again having electric mobility having uh, batteries in the system that might help to sort of uh, make off-grid applications more, more, more viable. But I think also that there's a lot of uh, 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 on the ground experience, which is needed to really see what can be done and what, uh, what, what is helpful and uh, to make sure that there's, uh, access, uh, that there's stable 
power supply and it's also not overly costly yeah? because the moment you go into off-grid applications then of course um, electricity price is much higher than for large scale uh, power power production yeah? so i think there's no simple answer to this but uh, i believe there's really much value in exploring the avenues of uh, joining e-mobility and rural electrification great thanks a lot alex uh, for your intriguing uh, response we would like to direct our next question to Kati. Uh, Kati, we have a question for you. We know that the SUM approach, of course, is, is, is a long process, uh, could be shorter as well, and uh, may require uh, some significant costs to, to city authorities who want to engage on this. Um, so we would like to find out from you that are there some opportunities for cities to fund uh, this process where they can secure funding uh, to get through this process. Well, thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Um, yeah, I think the question is, is very interesting and actually reflects um, the financial issue that we always have, I think, if we want to implement innovative uh, framework or even projects, right? So I think in this sense, at least for SUMP, um, I think uh, there, there is of course support from some organizations to develop this. Um, in Africa, I know that uh, some cities are developing SUMPs with support of um, some um, uh, international banks or international corporations. For example, I mean, uh, or other organizations like Mobilize Your City, for example. I think Mobilize Your City is really, like has presence in many regions. And I've heard that, uh, for example, cities in North Africa, um, I think it's Yaoundé, some, some of the cities uh, are already, Tunisia, some of them are already developing these uh, plans with uh, some support, for example, AFD or PGIZ. And uh, in others also are getting support um, from other uh, organizations like ITDP, for example, I think in uh, Ethiopia, for example. And like this, I think there are opportunities for sure. Uh, maybe not so, many, so much, but I think it will grow because now we know the importance of really changing how we do the things, right? We have been doing, uh, we have been planning transport in a traditional way, right? But we know this is not valid anymore for our cities and for the future of our cities. So actually, we really need to change how we do the things so we can have different outcomes. And in this sense, I think this will increase uh, the support from uh, also from outside. But also, I, I have to say maybe that in our cities, if we talk about SUMP, of course, it's a different approach, but uh, it's not actually so different from what we what we do in our cities you know we just need to change maybe a key aspects like what are our priorities right and if we have that clear that we want to prioritize sustainable modes and we have to we want to have long term vision and these key aspects then we are really planning for sustainable mobility and uh, it's just this specific aspect that we can change and it can be led also by local governments and maybe, of course, there is going to be a learning process, but uh, I think it's important to keep these uh, key things in mind. Amazing, thank you so much. So we, we, we have the hope and then uh, also for cities that um, there are opportunities to, to, to get the SAM approach uh, ongoing in soliciting uh, funding from the national organization. It's good to know that uh, even as we plan, then we we also think of the how how do we fund this planning process. Thanks a lot. Um, we will direct our next question to Amos. Amos, it it was so nice to see how the demonstrations in in, in uh, Kenya and Uganda are proceeding. We have a question from Janvier for you. Janvier would like to know what kind of data you are collecting to help you understand the, the, the demonstration. And then second, how are you sensitizing users to adopt or shift 
from uh, combustion uh, vehicles to electric. Thanks, Edmund, and uh, thanks, uh, Genevieve, for your question. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, what we are seeking to do in this uh, demonstration is to learn as much as possible. So, learning from this is uh, takes the form takes many different forms, and one of them is uh, first of all identifying the metrics of uh, the technical specific specifications that I shared earlier, and looking at how um, riders experience this. There is uh, I, you, you saw some of the things that I had projected earlier were the average range for different uses, the maximum speed, the weight that they carry. Um, for Uganda, for example, we are able to capture the elevation, the differences in elevation of the bike. So all of these have an impact in, uh, on, on the kind of performance you expect to get from, from this uh, unit. <clears throat> so these are the kind of, um, the kind of uh, data that you're collecting. You're also, also collecting the amount of uh, time it, it took to charge back to uh, full, um, the voltage deprivation and all that. So that what we are trying to see from this is we draw as much data as possible from this and I try to analyze them, see where there is there are linkages, where there are um, elements that you can be able to link together so that we know even even when we are recommending a, a certain spec, we are recommending a, a spec that would be almost equivalent to the ICE equivalent uh, uh, bikes that we have in the country. Um, so how do we determine that, that, that it's successful? If we draw as much learning as possible from this, 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 uh, this uh, unit that we are, we are rolling out. Uh, the second question was about uh, sensitizing users to adopt or shift to ICE uh, electric motor motor vehicles. Uh, uh, sorry, electric mo uh, motor vehicles. So, um, what we're doing actually, this demonstration is uh, more like an awareness uh, output because uh, you will, if you ask the riders today, the riders who are able to ride those electric uh, two wheelers, they are stopped every so often. And people want to know how comes this uh, unit is not making noise. Uh, why does it look so nice and it, it, it makes noise? It, it, does, it has a hub mountain engine. So there's a lot of awareness that's going with this. And uh, what we are trying to do is also um, bring into the fore the, the idea that uh, this is a viable technology by supplying the results that we're going to be, bring, to be offering at the end of the, of the pilot uh, phase. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, how, that's what I would say. We, it's, it's an ongoing thing. We have used the electric two wheelers as an entry point, but we are not uh, sort of like uh, um, ignoring these other vehicle segments, the LBVs and the buses, but this was the entry point and the easier ones to to you know, just go and do a lot of experimenting and seeing, seeing how, how, how we go around it. Thanks, Edmund. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Amos, for your clarification. Emily, would you like to take the, the last question, perhaps considering the, our time limitation? Indeed, and we have uh, still a whole week uh, to answer many more questions, uh, so stay with us. Um, I here um, have a question for Alex uh, from UNEP. Um, Alex, you mentioned the potential for retrofitting. Uh, does it make sense for all vehicle types? Um, and if not, uh, do you have some uh, input for us on uh, which vehicle type, uh, for which vehicle type it would make sense? Um, for instance, we hear different opinions about the, the opportunity to retrofit motorcycles. Um, so if you have some input for us, I think that could help uh, quite some people also in the call. Thanks. Thank you very much for this question. Um, so, again, I think it's a question which needs a lot of uh, differentiation and a lot of analysis of what is the what is the what is the conditions in a certain country? What is the uh, tax scheme? How can what, what's the price of vehicles because of whatever restrictions of importing vehicles to a certain country? For example, if you have an age restriction, um, uh, if you are only allowed to to, in, uh, to import new vehicles, then this would mean that the uh, used vehicles in the country are getting very expensive, and that maybe uh, leads to a leads to a, leads to a uh, uh, environment where it out of a sudden makes sense to retrofit vehicles which are already in the in 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 the fleet. Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no simple answer to it, and uh, I think 
really the, the main answer is that it needs a thorough analysis of what type of vehicle wants, uh, you, want to, you want to retrofit, what use case um, you, you, you have in front of you for, for that retrofit, and really what are, uh, what, are, what are the framework conditions in, in a certain country. Yeah? I don't think there's one fits it all uh, uh, answer to this. Now, in general, I would say, um, let's say the less value the actual new vehicle has, the, the, the more difficult it is to make, to, you, uh, to make a case for retrofitting. Yeah? Because with retrofitting, with, let's say, investment into a battery, with investment into an electric drivetrain, um, you, you put a lot of money on the, on, on the table. And if you now look at a, let's say, a used um, conventional motorcycle, which new costs just... I don't know, six hundred to eight hundred dollars before tax. Yeah, um, then of course it's it might be difficult to make to make a case with with retrofitting. Yeah? Why would you now invest a lot of money in in something which is already half over its lifetime or even more, and which at the in the first place is is not a very high value high value good. Yeah, but this doesn't mean that I would completely rule out retrofitting. Yeah, I, I think there might be room for retrofitting for all sort of. Um, Vehicles, but it really depends on the very particular business case and the very particular uh, framework condition. Yeah? Now, if you look at three wheelers, I think there may be the case for retrofitting might be might be a bit more attractive because you have a chassis already which is more valuable than uh, than a chassis for 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 a motorcycle. Yeah? And uh, but still, the setup of the vehicle by itself is sufficiently simple that you can actually retrofit it. Yeah? I mean, I would be a bit skeptical talking about retrofitting of a light duty vehicle, of a normal car. Yeah? I'm now just sort of uh, looking into retrofitting a, 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 a very complex vehicle, like, a, I don't know, like a, like a Toyota Pro Box or something like this, and now making that electric. I don't know, but even that, I believe there is, there is, there, is uh, that there might be room for it, depending on the framework conditions in a certain country, what the average price of vehicles is, what the uh, what the age distribution of the fleet is, what um, maybe what labor costs. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of parameters, so I don't think there's a simple answer to it. But I believe yes, there are there are uh, there are opportunities, and uh, also to mention the buses, uh, and uh, we we have uh, projects in uh, Solutions Plus where we look at retrofitting of buses. And I think buses, they can also be an opportunity because the layout of the vehicle, again, is sufficiently simple to retrofit to retrofit the drivetrain. I'm also looking at Kenya again. If you look at the um, uh, buses, which are based on Isuzu, Isuzu chassis and, uh, and the cab and the drivetrain, and then there's, a, there's bodywork on it to make it a bus. Um, so maybe that, that is a setup where, under certain conditions, retrofitting makes sense. Huh? I think that is really... Also, something where I believe Unip is probably not in the best place to give an answer. I mean, that is an answer which uh, needs to be provided by those companies trying to do it. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, so we unfortunately have to stop here, but I think that's the beginning of a very promising conversation. And to finish on time, I uh, give the floor back to Judy to close the session. Thanks. Thank you very much. A very special thank you to all our speakers and all who have contributed to the session today. A round of applause, virtual applause for all the participants as well. Um, you have been very engaged. This is just the first day of the Africa Regional Training. I see a concern that we have focused a lot um, on East Africa. That's because today was um, specifically uh, having a special focus in the program on East Africa. But of course, um, the case, uh, case uses from East Africa are applicable across the continent. And this is why we continue to encourage you to join us um, this week as we continue to dive into other topics around um, e-mobility charging infrastructure. Tomorrow, we will have um, the topic of solutions and standards. We hope to see you all there again, same time, same place. Um, it's a two hour session every morning this week, and we will be tackling a lot of different questions. There are a lot of questions about business models. Um, we have not answered this in depth right now because we have a session specifically on financing public procurement and business models on Wednesday. We hope that you will come for this session and have questions on this um, answered by our partners within the Solutions Plus project. Of course, once again, to remind you on Thursday, we talk about characteristics and localization of um, EV charging points. 
And on Friday, we have a very interesting discussion on a case for electric public transport in um, Africa. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful Monday, and hope to see you all tomorrow. With this, we end the first um, unit of the Africa Regional Training. See you.